that uh, these low rates affect the quality of interpreting in our criminal justice system. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, inviting me over. Thanks to Annette and, um, and uh, John especially, and to all of you. Um, I think I'm the last on the panel, so uh, John asked me to take advantage of this uh, extra minutes and, and show my 189 slides presentation. Uh, I kindly refrained, so um, I'm going to use the, the original one. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, propose you a, a move backwards, a sort of reverse journey from the European Union uh, courtroom to uh, the commissions for asylum determination, then to um, places of disembark disembarkment like hotspots and, and places of uh, first aid, back to uh, transit countries, um, detention places, namely Libya. Um, let me start with, with the judicial setting. We've been discussing all day uh, of uh, crisis setting, and, uh, and judicial setting is actually a crisis setting, even if uh, at first sight it may appear to be uh, not fully overlapping the, uh, the definition. Why do I say so? Basically because in Greece and Italy the situation are, uh, are almost identical. Um, fees for interpreters are uh, offensive, if not ridiculous. Um, waiting time for payments are uh, massive um, and also because the framework within which the uh, interpreting service is taking place is highly non-neutral is severely marked by power relationship. On one side we have the strong contractor, the judge, the decision maker, the lawyer, uh, the big NGO stuff. On the other we have uh, the weak part, which is the defendant, the victim, um, the asylum seeker. Then we have a technical challenge, which is, the, let's say, more close to the uh, proper uh, interpretation service, which is the challenge of translation and interpreting. Then with foreigners we have an extra challenge, which is what you see here on the slide, uh, named as cultural misunderstanding. Uh, clearly it's just a label, it's up to you, but I think the, idea, the underlying idea is quite clear. Uh, a clash of identity, of, of concepts. Um, the idea of untranslatables. I'm referring to uh, Barbara Cassin work on the dictionary of untranslatables. Untranslatable is a term that migrates from language to language uh, without finding a proper translation, a proper interpretation. And the underlying idea is that the act of uh, translation is uh, a, a continuous operation of adding and removing areas of meaning uh, without finding a, a stable and, and definitive uh, settlement. <clears throat> Just to give you an example, uh, an idea that I have, has been recurring in, in several uh, cases I've been following, the Albanian canon. In canon. Uh, do we have a, a proper translation into English or Spanish or French or Italian? Probably not. We need paraphrases, we need explanation. We could go for blood field or blood vengeance, but uh, that would not be a, a full, complete, rewarding uh, act of translation. You would definitely still more need uh, words to provide the idea of the implications behind uh, the, the notion of, of canon. So let's move to commissions for asylum determination. What is marking the picture here is that commissions, uh, in Italy at least, are not independent bodies, but are, are agencies established and embedded within the Ministry of Interior. And that has consequences that everyone can easily predict. Uh, there are some productivity requirements, which means since 2016 in Italy, uh, all decision makers are demanded to hold four interviews per day. 
meaning uh, interviewing four asylum seekers per day, which means if you ever experience uh, collecting a biography of an asylum seeker, uh, putting the decision maker and the interpreter in a position not to work properly in terms of quality. Uh, the outcome is that in a year you can, uh, put, they can boast having something like 70 or 80,000 decisions, but the quality of those decisions will be shown in a minute. Uh, furthermore, decision makers uh, haven't been selected on the ground of competence. Until last year, for 18 good years, uh, decision makers in commissions for asylum determination in Italy have been picked up only on the ground of belonging to some, um, let's say, to share some, some path, namely coming from government, from police department, or from municipality. Aside the UNHCR representative, um, no uh, decision maker, no member of commission was selected on the ground of knowledge and competence. Uh, you, can, you could easily actually find people having zero competence in geopolitics uh, interviewing uh, asylum seekers. And also, Selection of interpreters uh, is still non-transparent. Um, before the com commissions for uh, asylum determinations, um, interpreters are selected uh, f through a, a, an NGO. Uh, providing uh, reliable uh, interpreters, but still the uh, test, the, 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 the assessment of the competence of the interpreters is not shared with the commission or even with the public. So what is, what is the, the result? Uh, let me go through the line in the middle. Did you and or members of your family belong to a political party or group? If so, what were your, your, their, your roles and activities? No, none. Were you and or anyone in your family ever arrested, detained, or reported by authorities in your country of origin? If so, how many times, when, and in what circumstances? Were you ever arrested, detained, or reported in Italy? If so, when, how, many, how many times, and for what reasons? Um, clearly, this is a parody of uh, an audition. I hope everyone agrees uh, that this is not, nothing close to uh, an interview of an asylum seeker. But actually I have to tell you that uh, this is not uh, uh, an incident. This is um, the template, the model that commissions in Italy have been using for years. Um, and clearly the quality of the information gathered is completely inconsistent. Um, the notion of, of family is involved. What does family mean for someone coming from uh, Ivory Coast and, or, and, or someone coming from Pakistan? Hmm? Just imagine uh, an African applicant saying, my family is composed of 36 people. Do I have to reply to all questions? Um, furthermore, the interpreter is supposed to explain the difference between an arrest, a detention, and a police report. So. We've been discussing about the difference, the line that divides interpreters and cultural mediators. Uh, are we supposed uh, to expect that an interpreter, maybe speaking in Bambara, can explain the difference of arrest, detention, and uh, police report in Bambara? Does it exist, a word in Bambara, to explain detention and arrest as separate notions? Describe to me what happened. They arrested me when they were taking me to prison and on the road there were some Taliban who shot at the police and two prisoners accused like us died and we escaped. Your story is confusing. That's a, a, golden, a golden violation rule, a judgment from, from, from the decision maker during the interview. Your story is confusing. It's all very unclear, he insists. You have to know that the transcript of the interview comes from the decision maker. Let's go back to the confusing line, they arrested me and blah blah blah. They arrested me when they were taking me to prison and on the road there were some Taliban who shot at the police and two prisoners accused like us died and we escaped. What is missing? Punctuation. The basic. Punctuation. And punctuation is entirely lying within the sphere of control of the decision maker. So the lack of competence of the decision maker is disfiguring the voice 
of the asylum seeker. They arrested me, dot. When they were taking me to prison on the road, there were some Taliban. They shot at police and two prisoners accused like us died. We escaped. The same sequence of words. Just get to the underlined line. Uh, it's in Italian, but it's quite easy for me at least. Uh, clashes started between the Malian army and the rebels. And then you see capital letters. Emelela. What's Emelela? Nobody knows. Uh, Emelela stands for MNLA, Mouvement National pour la Libération de la Zawad. We are interviewing uh, a Malian applicant coming from central northern Mali, speaking about MNLA, and the, let's say the short circuit between the interpreter and the, <coughs> and the interviewer, the decision maker, completely alter and corrupt the information coming from the asylum seeker. I left my country, blah, blah, blah. Io abitavo in Via Bardo 17, you see the underlined line. I, w I used to live in 17 Bardo Street. The guy is coming from San Pedro, which is the second city of Ivory Coast. Actually, we were a bit surprised of seeing Via Bardo 17, like Italian, an Italian uh, uh, street or 17 Bardo Street. Uh, you have to know that Bardo, well, actually, that San Pedro is the second city of Ivory Coast, and it hosts the second largest slum of the entire Western Africa, which is called Bardo. It is so huge, it hosts roughly, two, maybe, because it's, I mean, it's completely unregistered, uh, it hosts maybe 200,000 people. Hmm? Um, but still, the complete misunderstanding between the three actors completely turn the information, and so an Italian uh, reader, whoever reads this in Italian, thinks that Via Bardo 17 is this. <laughs> Actually, this comes from Google Maps. It's Via Bardonecchia 17, which is very close to Via Bardo 17. Clearly a slum. <laughs> then if you still devote a second and you write on Google Bardo San Pedro, you will see this. <laughs> Which is very funny, not so much for the applicant actually, because if credibility is, the, is at stake, what could be considered credible within this framework in terms of colors, noise, sounds, dynamic, architecture, doesn't really fit this, which is a completely different context. Last. Abstract. In quel momento ero a zere corre. You see that line, zere corre. And then, in, in, uh, in short, phonetic. What does that mean? Phonetic means it doesn't exist. I used to live in New York, phonetic. I used to live in Athens, phonetic. No way. But if, I, if I'm coming from zere corre, and if in my interlocutor does know nothing, doesn't know nothing of anything about Guinea, he can easily think that Zere Kore doesn't exist, even if it's the second city of the country hosting something like 300,000 people. All of them are phonetics. <laughs> so, from commissions for asylum determination, then to disembarkation spot, <coughs> spots. You see um, an official paper coming from police that tells us how information are, are gathered at disembarkation. Uh, you see all general information from uh, on uh, really, um, pertinent with a, with a Gambian um, a Gambian applicant. You see those four lines at the end. Uh, reasons for entering Italy. Um, I was saying before that it's a non, highly non-neutral context, and, and this is a great example. This is a paper not officially aimed at um, presenting anyone as an economic migrant, not as a refugee. Let me explain you why. If you look at the, let's say, the, the part below Gambia, you will see reasons to enter Italy, and then you see job is the first box, 
which by the way is ticked, not surprisingly, then rejoining family, then fleeing from poverty, that's quite surprising, that has nothing to do with legal terms, and then fleeing for other reasons, then space, line, asylum, which clearly gives the idea that if you're coming to look for a job, you're not an asylum seeker. And that straight line, the very disturbing line, actually recalls the, the borders between Libya and Egypt and Chad and, and Somalia, those lines written on papers by, by colonizers on maps. If you're coming from for, for looking for a job or for a family or if you're fleeing from poverty, then you cannot apply for asylum. I was actually I witnessed using this paper in a, during a hearing, a judicial hearing, and, and police were saying, no, this guy, even if, if he applied for asylum, he's not a real refugee because when he landed after 40, 45 hours um, on the sea, in 30 minutes he was interviewed. That doesn't mean the interview lasted 30 minutes. After 30 minutes from disembarkment, he was interviewed, and probably in two minutes, he was, let's say, pictured like this. And if you see at the end below, you find the, the signature of, of the interpreter, but no indication on the language that was spoken. And so last stop is the transit countries detention camps, where people are dying, Libya especially. Um, I think one very interesting uh, concept is the lager jargon, uh, the special vocabulary that is spoken in detention camps. Clearly not detention camps that are meant to host people and provide services, but detention camps in which people are detained in order to be exploited, hmm? to be sexually abused, to be sold, like it's happening nowadays in Libya, uh, and where not understanding the basics means your chances of dying are much higher. Um, we just had a, 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 a huge case in Italy on, on Libya detention camps, and the public prosecutor, the, the voice of the state, compared the situation in Libya, detention camps to Nazi camps. And so let's go back to Primo Levi, a uh, survivor of, of Nazi camps, uh, the author of a masterpiece, If This Is a Man. He wrote that he, he managed to survive because he was very lucky and because he, know, he knew basics of German. Of German. Um, those who didn't just misunderstood orders, this beastie, savage, and, and outrageous language that was used in, in Nazi camps, and, and they just died because they didn't understand what was going on uh, around them. Um, so what we are seeing here is a sort of uh, mapping of a generation of orphans that lost or got separated from the fatherland um, and separated from the mother tongue. So from both parents to some extent. Uh, still a survivor of, of Nazi camps, Jeanne Améry, he wrote that the fatherland, is the Heimat in his language, is, is again, it's another untranslatable. It's sort of, um, uh, it's, it entangles the feeling of safety, uh, of belongings, of your root, of your shield, something like the Greek, uh, the Greek uh, patrida, hmm? if I'm not mistaken. So, best practices, uh, two more minutes, if I may. Can I? Yes, okay, thanks. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them because most of them have already been discussed today. Just a couple of, of uh, remarks. Synchronizing the talking rhythm. Um, we just mentioned before, I think Maria did it, that in, usually in the asylum uh, context, uh, it's consecutive interpretation that is taking place. Hmm? So the big question mark is, when do I stop speaking? If, if there's a missing information and an agreement between the two, uh, the, the applicant and the interpreter, who's going to say now, stop? Because I, got, uh, I can't take no more. I'm going to lose information. By the way, I have to say, in 13 years, I only see like two times the interpreter taking notes. I never saw an interpreter with a dictionary before the commission or uh, in court. So how is that regulated? There is a need of, of um, an agreement and, and, and sharing information between the two parts. Otherwise, the information is going to be lost and the applicant is not going to be aware of that. Um, then avoiding interruptions of, of the interpreter. Um, it's not because 
most of you are interpreters, but it's absolutely clear that interpreters are not recognized by a lot of actors, by the system, by, uh, by the law, by judges, by decision makers. Uh, in interrupting the, uh, the interpreter is, to some extent, an act of institutional violence because you um, basically you interrupt the voice of someone then in fact is the applicant who cannot reply and cannot understand that his voice has been interrupted. So that means that he's completely cut off and out of the, of the field of the discussion. And then medium and living archives. Um, what is the fiction behind the work of the interpreter in crisis settings? That he's providing a technical service and that he is a neutral medium, which is completely unrealistic. Uh, the interpreter, we mentioned before the idea of uh, vicarious traumatization, the idea of uh, um, compassion of fatigue. That's absolutely true, but at the same time there's an extra uh, feature that I'm, I would like to stress, which is the social responsibility that an interpreter, especially working in that field, is, is called upon. Uh, he becomes a living and walking archives. All stories, all biographies, all narratives that comes uh, through him or through her uh, clearly leaves traces uh, in, in them. Um, and as a best practice example, I think uh, it's proper to have to share a, a, a quick example of how uh, time, competence, and empathy could turn uh, that kind of parody of interrogation, of police interrogation, full of cluster questions and with no space of, of going deep into a, a, a real um, power story. 1992, late night at my family's house. Someone sat on my bed and hugged me warmly. It was my uncle, whom I never met. Later, I came to know that he had left to the mountains to join the PKK four years before. What is your name, boy? I was five years old then. Firat. That's very beautiful. It's the name of a great river. Are you attending school? I will start next year. He was peeling an orange, a fruit I loved, and I rarely had the chance to eat. What would you like to become? I can't remember what I replied. You should be a lawyer or teacher. He passed me on slices of that orange, delicious to my memory, and gave me another one. This is for your younger brother. Give it to him tomorrow. I won't be here. Twenty days later, something like a funeral took place in the courtyard. Adults were speaking of an unknown man. I could not understand. I sensed they were referring to my uncle. As I grew up, I discovered that he had been killed along other six comrades by a series of gunshots from an helicopter and from the ground. After the shooting, the wheat field where the bodies were lying was set on fire, and that was why they were, never, they were all unrecognizable. I have not eaten oranges since then. That's a story from an asylum applicant properly translated, I would say. Thank you very much. <laughs>